Hey. What's up? What's up? What's up? Holla if you hear me. I don't think you really want me to holla, but I do <laughs> hear you. <laughs> okay, as we get started, first I want to shout out Shelves Bookstore. You can see my t-shirt because reading is freedom. And Shelves Bookstore is this amazing bookstore. I think they're in South Carolina, if I remember correctly. Um, if I'm wrong, then put it in the chat to let us know. But they sell uh, both books, they sell merchandise, and it's uh, powered by the Sister Eye of the South, and she does an amazing job of maintaining this business. So if you are on the socials and looking for a great place to get some merch, then Shelves Bookstore is the store that has all of your Reading is Freedom t-shirt needs. I think nice. that's what Shout out to Shelves. Is that, spell, spell it? How do you spell it? Shelves, like bookshelves. Oh, Shelves. Sorry, S-H-E-L-V-E-S. S-H-E-L-V-E-S. Yes, Shelves okay. Bookstore. Cool. Shout out but to Shelves. Anywho, so, hey, everybody on the gram. Rhonda and Aaron here for our book talk. <laughs> For our book talk about We Pass the Shadow. Do you want to shout out whoever you're repping on your sweatshirt, your orange sweatshirt? Oh, I'm repping Angela Davis. and uh, Ah, Angela Davis. Ah, yes, yes. yes. Um, my favorite sweatshirt, which is in much of our TDP um, photo, many of our photos that we took from our photo shoot last season. That's right. Uh, we have to do a flashback on yeah. Graham. To yeah, you know, absolutely. Like Absolutely. Um, so, yeah. we cast a shadow. But first, no, we're not going to go into the big, yeah. all, to the list of books that we have read. But welcome everybody on NIG Land to the TDP TDP be reading book talk. Um, this is what book talk is this? Is this our eighth? Probably I'm counting the books uh, in the back. I think it's book talk a thousand. Yeah, book talk one thousand. Welcome. Uh, this book talk, we are uh, happy to explore the work of Maurice Carlos Ruffin, author out of New Orleans, with We Cast a Shadow, and dabbled in. I dabbled. I think Rhonda may have. I was uh, all in. Rhonda I was, was all, all in. in. She is a much faster reader than I am, uh, with the ones who okay. don't say they love you. Oh, my oh. God. It was so good. Yes, I read uh, two of the shorts, uh, Cocoon specifically, and uh, the ones who don't say love you, but I'm looking forward to reading more. But for the sake of the book talk, which we try to do at least once a month, um, I only got in two of those. But I did fully read and thoroughly enjoy We Cast a Shadow. You still get a round of applause. Thank you. Thank you. You get a round of applause for that. Thank for you. We Cast a Shadow. I, I am still not quite on your level as a reader, but I am proud of the progress that I have made. <laughs> That's why we have goals and we have tomorrow, right? Yes, we do. We always try for tomorrow. Yes, we always, to get, always. Uh, on my level up there. So, I appreciate um, that Rhonda, you, you presented uh, Maurice uh, Carlos Ruffin's work to us, and I had not heard of him, and I think this is his first book. But how did, how did he get on your radar? Well, you know, I'm a faithful reader of the New York Times, mm -hmm. and so I was just sitting here in this chair back there, actually, minding my own business, reading this review, and I was like, wow, this sounds amazing, and I had seen his name and his cover pop up on Instagram. I didn't know who he was, mm -hmm. and I thought, I need to get into this. I need to know who this person is. He has two books out, a novel, and a collection of short stories. I don't like to be left behind when there's a new voice um, that is making their way into, um, into the New York Times book review. So I said, hey, we got to do this. This looks um, wonderful. Yeah. And well, it was. It was. Yes. If I have I not told you already, I think I have, but I totally am very grateful that you did come along that article in the New York Times, and he's a damn good writer. Um, I've referred to oh it God, for the first so time good. as a page turner. I mean, I know y'all, all y'all readers out there, page turners may be a common thing, but <laughs> I, I, of the 10 books we have read, they've all been good books, but this is the first one where I'm like, I cannot wait to get to that next chapter. I don't want to put this book down Why? quite Why yet. Was it such a, 
why was it such a patient with you? I don't know. As we when we get into the talk, we um we come to discover that he kind of talks about his life and I just found, and he's a black man. So I just found him relatable. Um, and I just wanted mm -hmm. to hear where he was going, even though it was not a biography about his life. He told, he, the, mm -hmm. the main character is a black man with a son. Uh, uh, he's living in New Orleans. So he's from the South or in DC, of course, but I just, it felt it was something very relatable about the characters and about mm -hmm. the language he was using to tell his story uh, from Maurice itself. So. Well, uh, that's appreciate it. So, What's yeah. the plot? What are they trying to do? What, who is the narrator and what is he trying to do? So the narrator would be the father who was married uh, to a woman who is probably of Asian descent or is of Asian descent. Oh, she uh, is? I thought she was white. Okay, so she's of Asian oh, descent. Oh, wait, wait, wait. Oh, she had red hair, right? Why did I, I think wanna, so. I thought Penelope why I, was white. Why did, I, why did I make a beat? I'm, I may be crossing my books up somehow. Okay, but Penelope goes by Penny. Uh, so she, a white woman, they have a son who, of course, would be mixed race. And the son has a marking, a birthmark of sorts on his face and maybe on other parts of his body. Uh, he's fair skinned, maybe my complexion, your complexion, who knows. But there are marks on his face that are, are darker and probably the, the tone of skin tone of a darker complected black uh, person. And throughout the book, the father is wanting to eliminate those dark marks from his son's body uh, uh, through, the, should we get into the, the procedure that he's thinking about? He's wanted to- Demelanization. Demelanization. He wants to get a promotion at his job simply to pay to get his son a demelanization operation so that he does not have any darkness on his skin. Um, and they, they weren't really alluding to that they wanted him to be white but they did want, he did want those dark marks removed because those dark marks were definitely uh, resemblances of him being, of the blackness that was within him as a, a, a mixed child uh, with a black father and a white mother. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, so that's the, um, the, the context in short and the plot in short. I yeah. think that in and of itself, like from the beginning, sets the stage for the kind of world that we're living in. So this, mm -hmm. the, time period of this plot is years into the future, decades into the future. Mm -hmm. And Ruffin does an amazing job of doing flashbacks and kind of set, letting us know that at one point in time, we were here in the present of 2019, 2021, yeah. uh, what is time? But the plot is very much into the future. So that there is a procedure to become de uh, demelanized was shocking. And that was one of the horrifying elements of the book. So we're discussing this book on Halloween. Mm -hmm. That was one of the horrifying elements of the book to me that such a procedure existed, that it was well, well known and people engaged in it without mm -hmm. any shame. Um, so they're living in what I would consider to be this dystopian kind of society where society has really broken down. Were there other elements of the story that were particularly horrifying to you? Um, I wouldn't say horrifying. There were elements of the story that showed a side of life. Uh, I mean, I think he's, he is a lawyer and it showed uh, a side of uh, kind of a wealthy side, the way wealthy people look upon uh, you know, upper class, upper middle class black folks. It kind of showed that side of, of the world a little bit. Um, but you mentioned the word dystopian. It made me think about, I mean, even in, in current day, we could probably think of three or four celebrities who have undergone something to lighten their, their skin or um, for whatever reason, we, we, we may not be privy to because I haven't read any autobiographies of these folks who have lightened their skin. And no, I'm not talking about Michael Jackson. I'm, I'm talking of other people in the entertainment or sports world uh, who have purposely lightened their skin. And that's what I mainly thought about as I got further along into the book. And it made me think about what were their reasons for wanting to, to be demelanized for, for lack of a, another term. And why is it that they chose to uh, go down a path that would make their skin uh, not appear black? I'm back. You're back. I eliminated myself. <laughs> I'm trying so. to minimize what I see down here in the comments. And well, I ended up 
eliminating myself. So I'm not going to do that again. But we were talking about the horrifying elements of this book. We cast yes, the shadow. Yes, this book. Oh, yes. And what's, up? The... what's up, Kalea? Please give Indigo a kiss for me until I can give her one myself. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and that there's this procedure of demelanization. Some of the other horrifying elements that I found was the blatant concentration of Black people into the TICO, the mm -hmm. housing development that they described, that it was so commonplace to, um, to keep Black people in, uh, in those horrifying living conditions. It's, you know, obvious now as well. So it's not like we are oblivious to what happens in public housing and lower income housing, mm -hmm. but that society had disintegrated to the point where it was well accepted and the boundaries around the TICO could Works. be expanded. Mm -hmm. Then there was also the law that prohibited, I think, um, dreadlocks. If I remember correctly from the story that one of the struggles that Super Fargo had was that mm -hmm. he got his, um, his locks shaved by, mm -hmm. uh, by the police. So right, just just while he was in custody, not while he was yeah. charged or, or convicted of anything, but while he was in custody, they can make a decision that they need to shave your head, and, and that's what happened to him. And it just speaks to the how rights can be lost uh, as as we vote for people and they make decisions about what the laws of the land will be. That law of the land could fall onto the books at any time, mm -hmm. and in this case, it did fall on the books, and it's not too far fetched if you think about it, uh, in our society, uh, outside of, of uh, the society that Maurice created for us in his book. Um, what um, I was going on to, into a monologue as we, as we lost the connection, <laughs> 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 about this whole demelanization thing. I mean, there uh, are people in, in the celebrity world that you wonder what their reasons are for what has become pretty much a demelanization. And I was, I said that I was referring to Michael Jackson, but there are two or three people that I think can think of. And in saying that, I believe in the book, uh, Ruffin really broke down why the father probably felt so strongly that his son needed to have that spot removed or why his skin would, would needed to be lightened or why his life would be easier if he were in fact uh, light skinned or, or, or white. And as the, the book continued on, I mean, he, he just went to, to grave measures himself. Um, and I, I don't know if we want to spoil any of the book. I would love for folks to pick this book up for themselves to read it because I felt like it was a snapshot of what our world could become and is in many cases. Uh, I think we so. have to spoil it. We can't hold back on what happens. It's a book talk. It's true. Okay, I'll spoil it. You, your spoilers and book talks, I'll tell you, this is your thing. We read the book and we have to talk about the exciting <laughs> elements. When he right. dies, and when Penny died, that wow. was a um, that was a pivotal moment mm -hmm. in in the plot. It and was. Um, so, backing up a little bit, so yeah. we know that Penny was never an advocate for this demelanization. Right. She wanted Nigel to be accepted just as he was. But mm -hmm. what's interesting about that relationship is that it revealed how Penny and the narrator experience life so differently. Mm -hmm. She has uh, a sense of being aware of life. She says, I know things are difficult, but I think that she was speaking from a place of privilege because yeah. she had never experienced that level of discrimination based on skin tone, whereas the narrator had. And so mm -hmm. while she is, um, I support her decision of wanting to accept her child for who she is, I would appreciate it if she had said to him, there are things about this procedure that I will never understand. That being right. said, we're still not going through with it. And as you mentioned in one of our club chats, she was willing to divorce the narrator to prevent him from going forward with this procedure for Nigel. But Ruffin did something so interesting. He ends that conversation right there, tragically through her death. So mm -hmm. we never find out if she was in fact going to go forward with the divorce. And also ironically, she was killed by the police who said that he didn't see her. And in yeah. that scene, the police originally is really upset. They're like, oh my God, you know, I, I didn't see her, he's stumbling. But then when he sees the narrator, he's like, oh, 
-hmm. and then suddenly it becomes that much less important that, yeah. uh, that she was killed. Right. You know, I was listening on uh, NPR. I was hearing they were, they were having a book talk, and I wish I could remember what they were talking about, but they did talk about skin. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. Yeah, you're hilarious. Uh, sometimes. But they were talking about skin lightening cream on this particular uh conversation on NPR. It's on a Saturday. I need to find it. I do a few search words on Google to figure it out. But the guy was talking about his experience of buying some skin lightening cream at the corner store because he went to go get some eggs for his grandmother and they happened to be selling skin lightening cream. This is not in the novel. This is real life yeah. somewhere in the South. Um, he comes home. He puts the eggs down. He goes into the bathroom and he puts the cream on his face. And when he put it on his face, he said it immediately started to burn. Uh, it felt awful, uh, but he did not want to wash it off because he wanted it to take effect. And uh, it began to burn so much. And this, there's an actual scene in the book where he talks about how badly it burns. But, you know, as if I had not heard that NPR episode about someone's firsthand experience with skin lightning cream, this is probably 20, 30 years ago, because uh, he's, he's around our age and he was a, he was a preteenish age, around 12, 13. So probably about 30 years ago, 30 years ago, this skin lightning cream was, that he used. And just to read that in this book, um, that that same experience uh, was happening for Nigel, um, it speaks to our society and it speaks to the realities that Ruffin was trying to bring out. And, and uh, but the, the most interesting thing, and I hope I didn't cut my, my previous thought off too short, but one of the most interesting things that I got from the way the narrator was speaking is how he came to believe that it was important for his sons to not have melanin in his body um, through his father's incarceration through his mother's arm being broken through that whole incident uh through what other instances besides that main one where his father was arrested and, and do you think um probably made him think so negatively about being black or, or being melanated so he's a lawyer so that suggests mm -hmm. that he's gone through um, a rigorous education system to get where he is and we know that um, our education system favors whiteness and it favors children who, uh, who have a certain aesthetic, whether they just are white or look white. And so I believe that his education experience probably influenced his decision to want to, um, to see his son be as light as possible. And then also his employment at the firm also probably influenced his decision to see that. And observing his, uh, the community around the Tico, mm -hmm. um, seeing how Supercargo was treated, seeing how people in the neighborhood were treated. Um, but what's interesting there is that um, we can see both personally how people are treated based on their complexion, but it's, um, it's so pervasive that this preference for lighter skin that is something that you, uh, not just intuit, but you pick it up just by reading magazines, by watching television, mm -hmm. um, being in line at the bank and seeing how these subtle cues, our society uh, effectively, um, not brainwashes us, but makes it so natural that we believe, or makes it so prevalent that we believe that it's natural, that mm -hmm. it's just something to be accepted. Yeah and a preference that everyone should, um, should accept. And what Ruffin does in this plot is he advances the, this thinking all the way through to a conclusion of um, making it so accepted that there is a procedure to support it. So I think the narrator both had that personal experience with his family, but also just being a person in, in America. Has, um, also experienced that. Um, and our next couple of minutes, our final couple of minutes, um, I wanted to take us to some of the humorous aspects mm -hmm. of the story. Were there any funny elements <laughs> of the story or are there are elements of the story? Uh, that I mean, just the way he wrote is, it felt like a joning session on the playground uh, mm -hmm. sometime. Like, 
we're both fair skin, light skin, yellow mm -hmm. bone, whatever you, what we've been called throughout our life. Red is, bone. I've never been called oh. yellow bone. I've been called yellow, but oh, yellow. red bone. I think I've gotten yellow bone a time or two in my life. Fabulous. Um, but, uh, you know, and speaking to the book again, mm -hmm. I mean, they wanted to, that may have not have been an issue growing up is where I wanted to lighten my skin, but the fact that I had full lips or a full nose, that sort of thing. There were times in my life where I was like, oh, I wonder if I had smaller lips like Timmy that's on TV. Would that, <laughs> would that be more attractive? And thankfully, uh, uh, women and cousins and sisters and friends in my life made me know that uh, my nose and my lips were very beautiful. So I've, I've grown to love and accept them and, and love them just as much and more. But in speaking to that, there was one line in the book where he says, you got some real repugnant back to Africa lips for sure need to trim them shits down. That's one of my favorite lines in this book because one, it spoke to the experience I just uh, mentioned to you. But those lines were throughout the book and that's how I can recall my cousins or myself talking to folks on the playground or, or whatnot at school. And I love a book that's relatable like that um, where I can hear the language. Um, but other funny moments, what was your funniest moment that, that comes to mind for you? Oh my God, I loved every time the narrator engaged with Araminta. Mm -hmm. and his friend. <laughs> yeah. So Araminta is Nigel's friend. They start off as childhood friends and then they develop a crush and they eventually um, get married or uh, commit themselves. I don't know if they actually formally get married, but they commit themselves uh, you know, to life and have a children, etc. But in the beginning, the narrator is so irritated by everything that Araminta represents. She has a darker complexion. She is very mm -hmm. confident in that. She has a strong self-love. Um, her name is Araminta. We know that is Harriet Tubman's uh, first name. And so I love that Ruffin is signal signaling to us, the reader, that Araminta represents liberation, she represents mm -hmm. freedom, she represents confidence, she represents a, a woman who is unafraid to walk in her truth, who is going to literally choose uh, freedom or death. That's it. There's nothing, there's nothing else left for her. The narrator can't stand it. Like mm -hmm. she gets on his everlasting nerve. Yeah. But she persists in being who she is. And he has to respect that. Um, and eventually, she wins over Nigel. And so Nigel chooses not only her to be his life partner, but mm -hmm. the way that she also wants to live life. So yeah. I found every scene, I found his consternation just hilarious because his obsession with becoming lighter, his obsession with wanting to make his son lighter, his, his thinking that he was right in his perspective got on my fucking nerves. <laughs> I wanted to stab him in the eye mm -hmm. and just say, get over it already. Yeah. That's not like, it's not happening for you. So Araminta was my girl. I loved every time she got on his nerves because I knew that she was right. I believed in her opinion. Yeah. Other funny moments, Supercargo. I loved um, his, his everything, I think. Uh, and those two characters and even the narrator um, reflect something else that I think that Ruffin did exceptionally well, which was his character development. Mm -hmm. In just a few words, He's yeah. able to create these memorable figures that play such important roles in moving the story forward and creating conflict between the characters. So I would love to end up somewhere and just be steeped mm -hmm. in this conversation, minus the things like the dreadlock ordinance, no thank you, mm -hmm. but to be around these really, um, these really engaging and lively uh, characters would be, yeah. that would be a dream for me. Yeah, there's there so many, those are all I see you moments, right? They are meant to the supercargo. These are folks that people see through or people uh, brush aside and don't, and don't give, um, don't value. Mm -hmm. And I, I love that Ruffin made them some main characters and said, I see you 
and I know why you're important. And for Araminta to end up with Nigel in the end and to, to greatly influence Nigel throughout, uh, uh, whether it was on the pages or just for us to assume that she is, was a real, a real influence on his life. I appreciated that. Um, yeah, I think a couple things about that. Um, overall, I think Reppin does an incredible job of bringing marginalized people to the center. Mm -hmm. And he does that even um, more so in his short story collection. So when you read his short stories, you're going to encounter people who are always on the margins, people who are economically disadvantaged, who are working low wage jobs, people who are um, not cisgender, not heteronormative, people who um, are not white, wealthy, uh, of the upper class profession. And in fact, what he does in the short stories, which is so amazing, is he not only centers the marginalized, but he follows them through as they seek empowerment. Mm -hmm. And he also shows the weaknesses in people who are considered to be upper class. So yeah. in several stories, he has um, a few figures who you would think would be the, um, the underdog and would be ignored, but he actually empowers them and through their journey to either hold onto their house or their journey to, um, to be able to pay their bills, he highlights the weaknesses and the character flaws of the upper class. So you have to make sure that you read that book. But back to this one. Yeah. So back to uh, We Cast a Shadow. Um, were, there, were there other characters that you really loved from, from We Cast a Shadow? Um. Hi, Brandon. Not particularly. What's up, Brandon? Not particularly loved. I mean, Araminta, Supercargo. Um... What about Jojo? Jojo was such an interesting figure. Yeah, Jojo. And just like I am in real life with names, I remember those three very well. They stood out to me. But Jojo, for whatever reason, didn't uh, have, have gravi as, as much gravity. I appreciated mm -hmm. Jojo. Um, was there a particular reason why Jojo stood out for you or? Well, I thought that him as this lackadaisical kind of comical side hustle pharmacist mm -hmm. was important to, um, to, to contrast the narrator. So Jojo and the narrator, and we should say that Jojo is white. So Jojo mm -hmm. and the narrator went to school together. So they have this long history. And Jojo was basically allowed to just kind of loaf around and not really have any purpose. He had mm -hmm. people supporting him. He had family supporting his habits. His life had kind of uh, dissolved. Yeah. His marriage had ended. And so he wasn't really a person at, throughout the course of the book who was very stable. Mm -hmm. But he did not seem to have the anxiety that the narrator did. He didn't seem to have the problems that the narrator did in maintaining a family or maintaining employment. And I think Jojo was important in contrasting the narrator's struggle. So without Jojo, we may not have seen as diff um, how difficult it was for the narrator to, um, to, to move forward with, with his job and to stay married. So I think it was important to throw Jojo in there as, yeah. um, as, a, person that, as a person who's an example of, well, you can be an average white person of average intelligence of... Yeah. Uh, less than average effort, but still do all right in the world. So I think he played that role. So it's not like I really liked him, but I did see that his character was important. Yeah, I did appreciate that because, you know, the weight of uh, racism and the oppressiveness of it uh, does not exist for white folks. And I think that is that that's exactly what he was trying to say is that uh, even though you're a lawyer, you're doing well, you're trying to get all this money for this procedure, I'm divorced, I'm, I'm living you know here and there and depending on people i still am kind better of equal off. to better off than you even yeah yeah I'm emotionally and, better off yeah right. he's not experiencing that same struggle so i wanted to talk as we kind of wrap up about both the beginning of the novel and then also the end one of the first things that I texted to you as we were getting started reading this book at the beginning of october i was like yo i'm not I'm not <laughs> loving it. And uh, I want to explain why I wasn't loving it and how I actually came 
So and yeah. and how differently we probably saw that. That may have been what made it a page turner for me because you had to put it down and be like, ah, give you a little uh, slimy feel or something. Whereas I read and I was like, what the fuck? Dude so is, 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 is butt down. naked at a, par at, a, at a law firm party. Uh, very dehumanized. Uh, but anyway, break it down. But that was it. That was it. He, the dehumanization, uh, right? Yes. yes. So we meet the narrator and the first thing that he says is my name doesn't matter. And so as we were saying offline, Toni Morrison would ask, it doesn't matter to who. So I thought that, I was like, your name doesn't matter. Okay, so I'm getting big invisible man vibes here. This is sounding like the, the main character is operating in a world where he's basically invisible. It's like, mm -hmm. okay, so that already is disorienting. And then as he goes to describe that he's at this party where he and three, uh, two other associates, black associates, are seeking to be promoted and their promotion hinges on their success in a costume party. Mm -hmm. So the, the, the costume that the partners love the most will be the person who ultimately gets the promotion. And then he talks about the costumes that they're wearing and they're all very degrading stereotypes. Mm -hmm. And I was like, yeah, I just cannot do this right now. So I yeah. literally was plodding through chapter by chapter because, as you said very nicely, my <laughs> empathetic heart just could not handle it. Yeah. But he told it in a way that was fairly hilarious. Um, yes, your empathetic heart, the super empathy heart, super empathetic heart was on. Yeah, so was similar to in our character from uh, Octavia Butler's Parable of Sour. Maybe you were having some super empath uh, I would moments. love that. I could be <laughs> on the I love it. There you go. There you go. Yeah. Um, but you wanted to fast forward to the end from there? Yeah, are, so, are, are so... Are we going to throw in the unicorn paragraph? It's a long paragraph, but it was such a poignant paragraph. But <laughs> <laughs> I think that can be our conclusion. So I started okay. off not really loving this book because I found the world that he had created to be so disoriented, so mm -hmm. disorienting, um, so devastating to the spirit because all of the things that... Um, that we as a, a progressive society are desperately fighting against and that activists are doing so much to prevent had actually come to pass. So Referent, I think, is issuing this call that says, listen, if we don't really hammer down and actually focus on things like passing the Crown Act across all 50 states and not just the, I think it's uh, passed in like 11 or 13 states mm -hmm. by, um, preventing the, uh, the spread of laws like um, the lack of access to abortion in, and reproductive health in Texas. So if we don't yeah. take these issues seriously, climate change as well, if we don't take these issues seriously, then this is the world that, we're, that our children are going, to, um, are going to inherit and experience. Once Ruffin, moves, once Ruffin moves the narrator, out of the, uh, that scene with the lawyers and his firm and actually focuses more on the yeah. community. And we do meet um, more of his supporting characters. That's when I felt like, okay, I can continue reading this because I see that there are other characters in his world that are far more um, aligned with my, my perspective and my worldview. So I felt like those, those friends, even Sir, his mother, his cousin, Nigel, who I came to love, those characters articulated more of the perspective that I believed in. And so it was a lot easier for me to engage in the text when their voices took over. And so to your unicorn paragraph, the one that you love so much. Yeah, you want me to read it now? I think you want to read it. So you should go ahead, read it in your voice. That's going to help you launch your voiceover career. <laughs> no, but this is this is the the, um, the narrator's voice. Uh, this the father of Nigel, the husband or now widow of Penny. Uh, but it's towards the middle of the book. He says, "I am a unicorn. I can read and write. I have all my teeth. I've read Plato, Wolf, Nikki Giovanni, and Friend. I've never been to jail." I voted in every election since I was 18. I finished high school. I finished college. I finished law school. I pay taxes. I don't have diabetes, high blood pressure, or the itis. 
If you randomly abduct a hundred black men from the streets of the city and deposit us into a gas chamber, I will be the only one who fits this profile. I will be the only one who survives. Is it because I'm better than the other 99? No. It's because I'm lucky, and I know it. Somehow, the grinding effects of a world built to hurt me have not yet eliminated my every opportunity for a happy life, as is the case for so many of my brethren. The world is a centrifuge that patiently waits to separate my Nigel from his basic human dignity. I don't have to tell you that this is an unjust planet. That paragraph, Rhonda. Ladies and gentlemen, Aaron Sullivan <laughs> reading Marley's Palace. Ruffin, he is available for voiceover work. But yes, you were saying about that paragraph. Yeah. It, it just, I think, as I told you, I was reading, it was a page, my page turner. I got to page 134 of my version of the book. And, you know, previous books I've highlighted and bracketed all through but I was too busy enjoying the book to do any bracketing, but I had to stop it. It stopped me in my tracks and I had to highlight that paragraph. So I really appreciated uh, him seeing um, another side of, 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 of black folks that, that one out of 90, that one out of a hundred, uh, we all get placed in certain buckets. They, they liked all places in, a, in, in the Tico, but even the folks outside of the Tico uh, uh, encounter some of those same experiences that folks within the Tico or most of those same experiences folks within the Tico encounter. So it's a dope book, folks. Wait, we haven't talked about the ending. Well, we haven't talked about the ending when he. Oh my gosh. The ending, I think, is just incredibly important to think about because Nigel has taken on, he, first of all, Nigel has evolved as a character. He starts the beginning of the story as a young, impressionable child who believes what his parent tells him, who applies the cream, wears the hat, and mm -hmm. follows along with his father's plan to, uh, to eradicate this, this birthmark that he has, to minimize the appearance of the birthmark. But throughout the story, we see Nigel paying more and more attention to the politics around him, meeting people like Supercargo, seeing, um, becoming friends with Araminta, experiencing unconditional love from her, her teaching him self-acceptance, which is so beautiful, so mm -hmm. that by the end of the story, Nigel and his father reunite for a moment. And we know that his father pursued him basically to the end of the world to find him. And Nigel finds him, and he says basically to him, um, even though you have found us, we don't want you here. We, we don't want your beliefs. We don't want your opinions, your attitudes. I'm looking for, um, for that section. So where he says, oh, my gosh, I just found it. Mm -hmm. So... Um, she says, uh, she's right to say I didn't need to understand then, but I do now. I'll ask again, Dad, why did you really come here? So Nigel is really putting his dad on the spot and telling mm -hmm. him, like, be honest about what it is that you're actually pursuing in life for me. Just have the, have the balls to, to say it to my face, what you want to do. And then... Uh, so Nigel and Araminta have a baby and the baby is brown skin from the beginning, um, mm -hmm. not pinkish and unsure of what the baby mm -hmm. is going to look like, but comes out brown skin from the beginning. And Nigel says something to his dad. He says, do you honestly think you would ever be able to accept her looking the way she does? I, I stopped myself from speaking and looked down and here's Nigel again. At least you're really thinking about it. I appreciate that, but we don't need that in our lives. Go home. Enjoy what you've done to yourself, but don't haunt us anymore. Yeah. I love that. I love that Nigel had fully evolved, yeah. that he no longer had to listen to his ridiculousness of his father, and that he was able to speak so compellingly in his own truth 
but also with empathy. You know, he says, I appreciate that you're thinking about it, but mm -hmm. it's not for us. And then the last chapter, we see the narrator completely spiraling, like completely unmoored. He's traveling all over the world. Mm -hmm. He has his passport lost, so he lost his identity. And he's fully demelanated himself, by the way. I don't know if you mentioned that. He has fully demelanated himself. Yes. And so he is that, that character that we think of in Invisible Man, the person who has no ties to his community, who is uh, separated from his own identity, from his own sense of self, and literally is a migrant of the world and has no attachment whatsoever. And that's because he focused so much on becoming white that he is basically invisible. He has faded into a nothingness mm -hmm. where Nigel and Araminta, accepting of themselves, are very confident, loving, anchored, and rooted in their own world. Yeah. When we got to that ending, I was like, I'm done. Yeah. I, yeah. I, I, was, I was so spent by, by, the, uh, by the end of that story. Yeah, and I love the word shows and don't haunt us. Um, because what has happened for our parents or grandparents or our ancestors, it, it can be haunting for one reason or another. Yeah. But you have to really be careful about how you pass that on to the, to the next generation or if it is worth passing on to the future generation. Some may be protective or helpful, but a yeah. lot of it is uh, just carried on oppression uh, that can be released. Some can't be released. But some of it can, and in this case, it could have been released. Um, but when we but, hold on to those things and make it, it when we make it an obsession and not accept ourselves yeah. for who we are, we actually turn ourselves into nothing. Is right. what I felt like he was saying that this obsession with becoming white and mm -hmm. trying to um, not to be a colorblind society yeah. is actually going to be the end of us. Yeah. So that also left me feeling like, oh my God, I can't yeah. believe it. But it's so it's so realistic. So yeah. highly recommend We Cast a Shadow, an incredible read, great holiday read. So if you're going to look for something to read over the uh, Thanksgiving holiday, then this is a great book to snuggle up to. It's a great pair of books to give as a gift. If you want someone to be delighted by Ruffin's voice and really appreciate his uh, his critique of of society, so let's go ahead and begin to like really close. This is our third close. November is the month where we celebrate um, we celebrate gratitude. We celebrate uh, the role of food in our lives and the way that food can bring people together and we mm -hmm. also educate ourselves on the real meaning of Thanksgiving and right. relieve ourselves of the false narratives of Thanksgiving. And one right. way we're going to do that is by reading Black Food. Black Food. There's no way of saying I see you than being handed a plate or preparing a plate that has been well prepared by uh, that auntie, that mom, that dad, that uncle that whoever that you know put a bunch of love into that food. And this book at the back says stories, art, and recipes from across the African di diaspora is what we will be reading and sharing with you in Black Food. Who's the author? Or the editor, rather. I think It'll it's be Bryant Terry. Bryant Terry. Edited by Bryant Terry. Black Food. Uh, looking forward to digging into this one and checking out. I think we can prepare a couple of these recipes this month, Rhonda, maybe one or two to share with our TDP family. I think so. Well, we can share the experience. I don't know if we can actually share the food. That's true. I mean, That's true. Food, but I mean we can you know, share the experience. Got a, got a few local folks on the, on the, on the, on the ground that might be able to stop by and taste a little something. <laughs> but they're so lucky. Yeah. Thanks. All right. Well, great chatting with you about one of my new favorites, We Cast a Shadow. I'm so excited. Like, I take delight when you read a book that you really love. Hey, you knocked it out the park. Shout out to New York Times. Shout out to Rhonda Anderson. Uh, another, what did they say? And another one. <laughs> On that note, peace out, Rhonda. Peace out, TDP fam. Peace.
Tchau, Samuel.